Good evening, I'm Clarence Boone, and welcome to Bring It On, a multiple award-winning radio broadcast in our 19th year as Indiana's only weekly community radio show committed to exploring the people, issues, and events impacting the African-American community. Good evening. I'm guest co-anchor and contributor Vernon Williams. Unexpressed is proud to present five never-produced one-act plays at this year's festival, presented by the Africana Repertory Theater of IUPUI in conjunction with Indie Friends. Productions will be staged November 3rd through the 5th at the Indie Friends Basile Theater and at Christmas Addicts High School's Auditorium November 10th through the 12th. And for our listening audience, I want to share a little bit about tonight's co-anchor. Mm -hmm. First of all, Vernon is a lifelong friend of mine and certainly no stranger to bring it on. Going back to his days at Black Expo and the Indiana University Alumni Association, he has come on this show to inform, educate, and challenge our listeners. With a career built on journalism, marketing, and education, Vernon uses his experiences to help tell the story of how IUPUI engages with the community while also building upon the collaborations the campus has built with the community. And with that, Vernon, share with our listeners this year's Onyx Fest lineup, and afterwards we'll engage the playwrights. Awesome. The first is Tigany by Levi Frazier Jr., a man whose checkered past comes back to haunt him, a tale of regret, repentance, and reconciliation, religion, and hypocrisy all surface on the stage in Tigany by Levi Frazier. Five Moods of Black Anguish by Josiah McCruston, inspired by the works of Zora Neale Hurston, Langston Hughes, and August Wilson, heavy hitters, spoken word, praise, prose, and sermonettes accent this production that explores the pain and glory of a people with unconquerable experiences and spirits. The Heart of a Man by Audrey Ori, an all-male cast will stage this production that reveals the eye-opening and sometimes harsh truths on dating, marriage, sexuality, domestic violence, and love from the male perspective. Right Behind You by Deborah Patrick features generations of women who reflect on contrasting experiences as the elder of the family is dying of COVID-19 in the early days of the pandemic. And last but not least, Babe by Dolores Thornton. It's based on a true story. Therapy helps reveal the buried truths of an 82-year-old African-American woman who reaches that inner depth of reconciliation and self-realization. Well, that's an awesome lineup. And joining us to showcase their respective plays, we have Levi Frazier Jr., Josiah McCruston, Audrey Ori, and Dolores Thornton. And uh, we are waiting the arrival of one other individual, but um, uh, we want to hear from these individuals. And so let's uh, let's start off with Levi. Levi, tell us a little bit about yourself and what's the inspiration behind your production? Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, again, my name is Levi Frazier Jr. I'm a native Memphian. Um, my friends and I started a theater company right out of college. And because as we looked around, there was nowhere for black theater to exist. There were the shows that most of the black people were doing in Memphis, they were playing the maids and butlers. And we said, hey, there's more to us than maids and butlers. Nothing wrong with that. We are, have a lot more to us that's being presented on stage, at least in Memphis. So we started that theater company. Then about four years later, now about two or three years later, we started another company, my wife and I, out of that company called Blue City Cultural Center. So 
our company has been in existence for 44 years, be 45 years in April. And we've done shows in different places around the United States. So I've also taken some shows out of the country. So that's what I do. And I also taught at the University of Memphis for a while, then at Southwest Tennessee Community College, where I retired about two years ago. And I love to write, and I really love being a part of Onyx Fest. This is such a beautiful experience. I can't really put it into words, and I'm sure everybody else thinks the same thing who are writers uh, with this organization. Thank you, Levi. And uh, now moving on to Mosiah, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and the inspiration behind Five Moods of Black Anguish. Hi, my name is Josiah Ray McCruston. I am a um, creator, director, writer, um, pastor. I am also an educator. I do, I do have a lot of different things. Um, but the inspiration behind um, Five Moods actually came from um, my love for the three artists that you heard before, Zora Neale Hurston, Langston Hughes, and August Wilson. Um, Langston Hughes has a piece called 12 Moods for Jazz, and it is a time capsule that deals with improvisation, but also um, there's this beautiful, um, there's this beautiful description that he has in the margins for musicians to create whatever they want to in that moment. So um, I took inspiration from his collection of work. I also took collection um, inspiration from the collection of work of August Wilson and his century cycle. I also took collections um, from uh, the anthropologist and the um, amazing artist and author that was Zora Neale Hurston and combined their inspirations to create this one piece. Um, Five Moods is actually an excerpt from 12 Moods. I couldn't put all 12 on stage for you this year because, um, you know, we, we'd be in there for a minute. But um, I am grateful for um, the sharing of Five Moods. And my actors are doing spectacular. Um, each piece not only goes through um, time, but it also goes through different Orisha and deities of the Black tradition. It also tells um, deep, personal, um, introspective stories. And one um, that is based on sort of a mix of all three, uh, which is the telling of the story of Salah Udin um, or Mr. Samuel Housley. And he is not only connected to August Wilson because he grew up with August Wilson, he is not only connected to um, Langston Hughes because he taught at Langston Hughes Elementary, he is not only connected to Miss um, Zora Neale Hurston because he uses her um, life inspiration of education and self-efficacy, but he is also um, still alive today. So I'm really excited to showcase and talk about his life and do some like deep introspective look at what his work as a freedom writer really looked like. So um, this piece culminates in about 55 minutes. And in that 55 minutes, you will laugh, you will cry, you will you will feel deeply uh, for these characters that uh, my actors are bringing forward to you today um, on the day that you come to the show. And um, I'm excited because it is a deep spiritual work that I have been working on for over 10 years. So um, it is it is finally coming to fruition. I'm going to stop talking now. Amen. It sounds, it sounds like you poured your heart into this. Um, and... Uh... Wow, this is sounds like it's very impactful. Ardry Ori, um, please uh, introduce yourself and tell us the inspiration behind the heart of a man. My mind is just kind of <laughs> twirling right now. So, so help us out here. Yes, thank you all so much. Um, and I want to just say thank you uh, to Indie Fringe and everyone who has been instrumental in making sure that Onyx Fest comes to life and we're very excited to be a part of this. My name is Ardry Ori. I am a celebrity ghostwriter. 
and I have been writing for 35 years. Um, I am very excited about the opportunity to produce um, my writing in a format that can be felt and that can be seen visually because most of my work is in the literary space. And so um, this production, The Heart of a Man, is something that I wrote several versions of. The first version um, that, I, that I started working on was approximately seven years ago. And um, at the time I watched the unarmed killing of a black king and I felt extremely helpless. This was at the hands of the police. Um, I was just not sure what I could do. But what I did know is that there were so many men present in my life and men even that I didn't know who I felt had no place to expose their feelings or to express them. I felt like at that time, there was not really a safe space for that. And so I started to um, ask my husband questions that I had never asked. I started to ask my son questions. I started to interview um, men around me. And I just wanted to know if you had an opportunity to say one thing um, and, and people had to listen, what would you say? And so those commentary, those um, emotions and things that they expressed, those became the basis for the create for the characters that I created. And so each character has something to say. And I just feel like in this country, Black men aren't always free to express. And the stage offers us an opportunity to allow this to happen but we also have to all sit and listen. And so we cannot interrupt, we cannot interject, we can't you know, impose our feelings. It is just the men expressing. And so that is what the heart of a man is all about. Thank you for that. And um, Dolores Thornton, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about Babe. Hi, my name is Dolores Thornton. I'm an Indianapolis native and lifelong resident. Uh, I consider myself to really delve into everything artsy. I'm an author, a publisher, a director, a production manager, uh, a curator of art exhibitions and modeling and style shows. I do just about anything with the arts. Started my company in 1996 when I wrote my first novel, Toured the Country Twice. Uh, was a member of the first African-American book club summit at sea in 2000, where we sailed to Cancun. So I've always been immersed in the literary scene. Uh, my debut novel was entitled Ida May. It was fiction. My mother read it. She loved it. She asked me to tell her story. And I laughed and I said, you know what, mama, you really don't have a story. All you did was marry daddy and had 13 of us, but she was adamant. She insisted. And so I went to her house. I started going in the evenings after work with a tape recorder so I could tape what she had to say. And that very first day I left there and sat in my car and cried. I couldn't even drive off uh, the horror that my mother had gone through that she had never revealed uh, Babe is a story of an 82-year-old African-American female who's starting to have headaches and nightmares. Her daughter takes her to the doctor. They don't find anything wrong. And hypnosis is introduced. And through that process, her whole life unfolds all the way back to age five when she witnessed a lynching and a beheading uh, on her way from Georgia to Indiana. And everything they thought they were escaping, they ran right into when they got off that midnight train from Georgia because in 1922, D.C. Stevenson had moved to Indiana and headquartered the Klan from here. Mm -hmm. So um, my mother had so many issues. For two years, she would not utter one single word. She was five years old when they arrived. She was two years late starting school because in those days, if you had a child that was disabled or blind, anything like that, uh, they just stayed at home. So that made her two years late starting school. She was teased uh, for being behind. 
And so uh, story is so endearing and it makes us face the fact that Blacks do not receive mental health care like they should. We even shun uh, health care in general. Uh, there are so many taboos in the African-American community and feeling like people are in our business. Some of the vestiges from slavery uh, and the horrible experiments that our people had to go through. And so uh, it was really painful. I wrote this book in the year 2000. And like I said, I toured the country with it. People fell in love with it. And I was just afraid to try to touch it in any other means, like with a film or a play. Uh, some of my other books and plays I have, you know, brought to the stage and to the screen. But Babe, I was afraid to touch. And then when I decided with Onyx Fest, I was so excited to be a part of this. And I was like, I can bring it on, you know, through Onyx Fest if I'm selected. Thank God that I was. I've enjoyed the experience thus far. And I had a major hurdle uh, because I was afraid to let Babe go. This was my mother and my mother's story. And I was afraid nobody could do it justice. And I didn't want to be mad at somebody. So um, eventually I stumbled upon Dr. Leandra Radford, uh, the principal of the Renaissance School. And she uh, offered to do the part. We uh, went through rehearsals and everything. And I just thank God that uh, she was selected because there's no way I could have done more justice to this story than she is doing. Um, like I said, it, it it has some spiritual uh, uh, connotations and everything to it, some old Negro spirituals. And that's just a part of me. I'm a licensed ordained minister. And so a lot of that comes through in my books and in my plays. And I just, like I said, I thank Onyx Fest. I thank you today for this interview. I know people are going to love this story. I know they are. And thank I thank you. you. Thank you, Dolores. And uh, again, as we mentioned, uh, one other playwright was not able to join us tonight, but her name is Deborah Patrick. Uh, she um, produced Right Behind You, which is a play about the generations of women uh, who we are reflecting on contrasting experiences. One in particular, as the elder of the family is dying of COVID-19 in the early days of the pandemic and, and all five of these productions just, they sound powerful and, and, I, and, and I know they will be. If you've just tuned in, we are having, we are beginning a conversation now with the playwrights who really serve as the precious treasure of this 2023 Onyx Fest experience. And uh, the gentleman who is co-anchoring tonight is no stranger once again to WFHB or Bring It On and uh, He's a man who has himself produced many, many works, both um, plays and also in writing. So Vernon, I, I wanna turn this over to you and, and just tell us what the audience can expect to experience, not only from these powerful plays, but just uh, what will they walk away with in your opinion after experiencing this? Well, as you can hear, they bring such unique qualities and subject matters to the stage. I don't know if we've ever had a year when we had such contrasting stories to tell. And that's a beautiful thing because that means that the people who come won't see the same thing twice uh, if they come to all five plays. Um, you can feel the passion in everyone's voice, which speaks to the amount of energy poured into just putting it on paper and then seeing it on the stage. It's, it's an ordeal. And um, what I want to do is hear them go right down the, the line in the same order that they originally spoke and talk about what was your most challenging, what was the most challenging aspect of getting this particular play together um, as you were writing it? What was the most challenging aspect and how did you overcome it? just going down the line in the same order. Okay, well, thank you, Bernard. I, I didn't talk about my play as much as what I, I talked about myself in our theater company, but I'm glad you asked us to do that. I, first of all, had this thing in mind, but I used to teach Oedipus Rex and Antigone and all, and I said, if there's a play, a tragedy 
worse than Oedipus Rex and Antigone, I do not want to read it or see it. And so what I did, I said, but what would that be like today? And I had been working on this idea for, I know, at least five or six years, just gathering information, thinking about it more than gathering information. And then one day it hit me, uh, and I knew it had something to do with drugs and and, and addiction. And, and one of the, the toughest things for me was just being real with it you know i don't i didn't want to feel like i was making up something uh but it's based on things that i had heard that actually took place and so i wanted to put that in there and i didn't want to shy away from it so to be true to life and i think that's what we all want as writers we we are in search of truth because when we when we have people who look at our work or see it on stage or read it we want them to come away with a magicum, at least a magicum of truth. But, and that's that's what happened with me when I was putting together Tigany. And of course, Antigone is a Greek drama, but this young lady calls herself Tigany because of her situation. So, okay. hi, uh, Josiah McCruston again. And I think the most challenging uh, part of bringing this story to light was uh, uh, the concept creation, essentially. And then um, along with creating what this mega concept was, uh, was also the, um, I had a deep struggle at the top with naming what this was. Um, naming the genre that this would fit in. Um, my biggest struggle um, was also talking about deities um, or Orisha because in fear of what, um, you know, the church folks will say about you, you know, uh, what what you mean about deities? You know, <laughs> um, what what is that thing? So I was worried mostly about... Um, exposing what these uh, black spiritual bodies would look like. And I was reminded uh, by a good friend that the writers of um, all these great epics and all these great dramas, they use the world that mirrored them best. And um, I feel that exposing uh, these great <laughs> beings that exist in our Afrocentric culture is um, one of the most important things. So one of my biggest challenges was um, feeling that it was okay or appropriate to talk about these things. And the overcoming of it made it, uh, made the piece even more stronger at the end. I think we come to uh, Audrey at this point. Yes. Um, I would say, honestly, just for me, the most challenging thing was making sure that the voices of each character, that they were captured with uh, the true integrity for the messaging. Um, as a, you know, I am obviously not a man, um, and so making sure that I wrote pieces that were authentic to the challenges and the, the struggles that were shared with me and that I removed myself completely from those voices and allowed only what had been communicated to me and the, the realness of the characters, the authenticity. I would say that is what was the most challenging initially. Um, and that challenge was actually something that I'm happy to say was overcome because as the men perform their pieces and become one with their characters, everything resonates. You know, they feel very passionate through their presentations um, and they connect. And one of the exercises that we do with our cast, um, what we did and we're very proud of is having each cast member to kind of share how the piece that they have been assigned 
um, what personal journey that they have that that they find connects with the character. And there was not anyone who didn't have some type of connection, whether it was, you know, uh, a father and being present, whether it was being harassed by police and feeling um, ostracized at times when going into places as a black man or whether it was um, feeling mis misheard or misinterpreted. So everyone connected with their characters and that was very meaningful for me because that was the intention. So we did overcome the challenge. And for me, I think the most challenging part of uh, trying to do a play was trying to figure out what to put in, what to leave out. Because uh, the average book, let's say if it's between two and 300 pages, it's very difficult to bring all that emotion and everything from a book to the screen or to the stage. And so you have to be very careful when you pick through it that it still has that flow. It still has to make sense. And like I said, being a award-winning book, there were people around the country that read it and loved it. And my fear was, if it comes to the stage or to the screen and people are gonna say, well, so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so didn't happen because like we all know, nine times out of 10, if you've read a real good book, especially something like Joshua's dealing with Zordon and Hurston or something like that. And when you see it on the screen, it's like people walk away saying the book was so much better. And mm. so that was a challenge to me is to try to bring all of that emotion and bring my mother's powerful story and let people, you know, accept it. And maybe I left out somebody's favorite part, you know, or maybe I put in something that people didn't like, because even though it's based on my mother's story, it is fiction because I embellished it. Like I said, I put in things and even took out things in the book, but, um, Anymore, I have found and studies have shown that we are evolving. People are not as much as in tune to sitting there for days on end reading books because they'd rather go see a movie or go see a play, spend an hour and a half with a friend or a family member and, they, and they're done. And so that's the reason why I started a couple of years ago looking into plays and film and using my seven books as reference material. And I even have uh, my hardbound thesis from seminary that is the complaint in the book of Job. I can't wait to bring that to the stage. Uh -huh. Dolores, I think you need to tilt your camera down. We can't see, there you go. Okay. Here I am. <laughs> so put simply, and we're going reverse order this time. What do you hope people will take away from your production? And and not a not a laundry list of things, but if there's mm. just one thing that they take away, just one, mm. what do you hope it's going to be? I would hope that people would take away from Babe the fact that uh, we need to listen. We need to listen to the elderly. I tell people all the time, everybody has a story to tell. And mm -hmm. when I laughed and told my mother she didn't have a story, I was so very wrong because we all have a story. So many Black people have gone to the grave with family recipes that we can never get back or so mm -hmm. many stories, some happy, some sad, but we ought to listen to older adults when they say they have a story. Mm. That's powerful. Audrey? Uh, I would just ask that people listen um, and listen for understanding, that people leave feeling compelled to listen for understanding. We are you know, I would say the, the family is under attack. I would say that, you know, there are lots of agendas um, that sometimes don't allow us to unite. And this production's message is the opposite of that. And so we are stronger together, but it does take 
a concerted effort to try to have understanding and accountability. And so my, my one ask was, would be that people leave with an understanding, the deeper understanding and a desire to hear from our black men. Okay. Okay. Josiah, what do you hope your one takeaway is? What I believe is the takeaway for five black moods um, is the sheer expression of joy, even though the title is anguish. Um, the opposite of what um, the piece does is it gives a sense of pride and joy in not only these expressions, but uh, the fact that we are not alone and the things we have been experiencing for um, centuries is not a, um, it's doesn't mean that we end now our situations are never our destination. So um, I believe that joy, relief, and um, pure solace and pride is what people will walk away with. Okay, Levi? Simply put, when, when a person leaves my production, I hope they come away, away with that before you leave this earth, you should forgive somebody and somebody should forgive you. Okay. Okay. That's well put. That's well put. And all of these are powerful. As it seems like I'm using that word over and over again, but it's powerful. Mm -hmm. And it's also causing us to look inside. It's also causing us to maybe face our fears and apprehensions um, and the power of forgiveness I'm hearing resonating tonight. And uh, the power, well, the power to to do the work. And sometimes mm -hmm. reconciliation is work. I'm so tired sometimes when you have an ought with someone to express and then say, oh, uh, I forgive you. No, 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 no. Sometimes you yeah. got to unlayer. And I hear yeah. that tonight. Uh, one question I have is that I've, I've sat through a lot of uh, presentations or plays, rather, and powerful, moving, challenging, riveting, all these different uh, descriptors and the really impactful plays have a talk back portion afterwards mm. will that be incorporated in next week's uh, series of productions you know i can speak to that um originally it was not going to be a part of it but um we've had so many requests from the playwrights and so much thought brought to that subject by those involved that we've decided to, uh, for the first time, for the first time for Onyx Fest, build in a short period after each play for feedback. Now it's gonna have to be tight because we have to get ready for the next production. But um, it is kind of, people do leave feeling some kind of way when they've right. been moved and haven't had an opportunity to express themselves. So we are going to try to address that, Clarence. I'm glad you asked that question. Well, hopefully I have a, a, a good follow-up to that. Um, one way to maybe manage the time, because time is precious. Mm -hmm. um, if the playwright can come out, introduce themselves, and say, by show of hands, how many have felt this way or that way, or how mm -hmm. many feel that they're going to go home and mm -hmm. do the heavy work, and, mm -hmm. and reach out to a loved one who may be up in age, because how many opportunities do we miss from not sitting down with our elders yeah. and, and doing the hard and sometimes maybe painful work yeah. of, of hearing their story? And Well, uh, I'm, I'm so going to leave it to the playwrights to decide. That's a great idea. Uh, and, and somebody's probably going to pick that up. I'm going to leave it to the playwrights to decide how to handle their talk back um, uh, uh, all the plays don't have the exact same thing. So mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm sure each one of them would do it a, in a way that economizes time. Since like you said, uh, it's gonna be a, a tight window, but um, we're gonna make that available for the first time and see how it works out. And, and Vernon, are you in a position to provide some, um, 
an overview of right behind you. I, I know that Deborah Patrick could not join us tonight, but can you can you share any insights? You, you, know, you know, um, I don't want to uh, misspeak a mm -hmm. for a playwright because um, uh, being a playwright, uh, I, I've been, had anxious moments when people have said one thing about my play when it was really something else. So this is what I'm going to encourage everyone to do. Go to onyxfest.com, mm -hmm. onyxfest.com or Indie Friends. Go to either of those websites. You will see an interview with her. She talks about the play. She talks about herself. And you'll see a full description of the story that she can frame much better than I. So onyxfest.com. And as a matter of fact, you'll also see these other four playwrights work uh, at that site displayed as well. And uh, are there plans to take this uh, out abroad further into the community other than uh, the places that are uh, scheduled to air this next week or to present this next week? This is what we always say. The original plan is, of course, to uh, present it during the um, production. But we never know where God is going to lead this. We've had three plays that were picked up by production companies outside of our control, where they saw the plays and brought them back the next year. Uh, two of them have gone out of town, and and uh, and one is no one of them went out of town. Two of them were local. So when these plays are presented, you never know what's going to lead to. Funding for Onyx Fest. It, it does take funds and resources to pull all this together. Where, where does this all originate? Well, funding um, for Onyx Fest um, uh, comes from sponsors, comes from uh, uh, grants that we're able to accrue. Um, and we actually have people through the year who actually donate to the cause because they believe in it. And, and that, that sponsorship information is also at the onyxfest.com uh, site because we are constantly in need to be frank about it. Because like you said, it's, it's, it's a challenging situation. It's, it, it costs money. Uh, we award all five of these playwrights with a full production grant, okay? Uh, so um, we have to make sure that we can raise those dollars to provide them to them. Excellent. And I want to ask the playwrights, uh, if you share with me, uh, how you go about casting? Because you have a message you want to get across and you need the right actor but with the right persona. Uh, share with us, how do you, what do you do to select the right cast for your productions? And I'll start with Josiah. For me, the process was um, looking um, at the actor and how they transcend the character. Um, there were a few audition tapes that I received that they did great work. They were um, available and they were vulnerable, but they did not transcend the, um, the piece as it currently was. I am not looking for someone to play the part. I am looking for someone to become the part. So in the audition process, my eye is a little bit more, um, I found it very challenging because it was a little bit more scrutinized. I, I was I was very nitpicky because A, this is um, a 10 year passion piece for me. And also, um, I did not want to be, like Dolores said, I did not want to be upset with someone for mishandling the work. So I um, handpicked each actor and chose them um, based upon um, how well they would transcend the piece and also how I felt um, them make the the story come alive. Because a major piece of my um, play is the storytelling aspect. You have three of the most dynamic voices 
um, Zora, Langston, and August, and all of them were phenomenal storytellers through their pieces. So I'm not looking for just regular actors. I'm looking for transcenders and storytellers. Levi? Um, let's see. If you can repeat the question for me, because I, I, was, sure. I was listening to Josiah, and I was like, wow. Sure. Uh -huh. uh, uh, the art of casting, the play. Oh, yeah. You know. yeah. And, and then just to prepare you, wanna, I also want to talk a little bit about how you set the stage, uh, the ambiance on the stage. How do you draw the, the viewer in into a certain time period? Um, how do you disarm them through how the stage is set? But first of all, casting, you have to have the right vehicle to deliver. And, and how do you go about selecting that voice? Yes. Well, I, this is one of the shows I, probably the first show that I've written that I didn't direct it the first time. Hmm. I chose a director for this particular show, uh, a gentleman who actually went to Indiana University in Bloomingdale. And he's a Kappa. And so he's excited about getting back to Indiana. Uh, he's actually from New Orleans. And the main character is from New Orleans. And so these and synchronicity, things started coming together without my control, without my input. And so I said, Lord, well, let me just stand back and see what you do. <laughs> because obviously, you're in control of this. So I ch he was chosen as both director and he's in the show he plays the lead the only two characters and then we had auditions for the young lady in the show and we, it was tight but we eventually came up with this young lady uh michelle mitchell and she does a great job and she has a certain innocence to her and at first i didn't i didn't think that innocence was going to work because of the type of character you know she's a femme fatale and i said but then what better femme fatale could you have than a person who seems innocent? And so that's what she is. She seems like that, but it works out very well on stage. Yes. And uh, Dolores? Well, for me, uh, casting is never a problem because I do skits and plays all year. And I work with children. I work with adults. I work with older adults. So I already know when I devise a plan or a program, I know people's individual uh, skills and where they are best suited. Uh, I have a series called Black Voices from the Past that I put on normally every other month where I bring back obscure uh, people from our past history like uh, the Long Ranger and Betty Boop and a lot of people still don't know that these were Black people and so this is what I do. I uh, attended an historically Black college and so that Blackness is just in me and I tell people all the time Black History Month ain't over. So this is something that I do always and I work with, uh, I have like I call it a war chest of characters that are at my disposal. Uh, over the years, I have lost two of them, two males, uh, one to just really old age and one to cancer. Uh, but um, selecting or finding the most difficult part for a babe, like I said earlier, was trying to select someone to be babe because I did not want to let my mother's story go. And so that was the only challenge I had with this. And then Audrey. So for casting, you know, it was really laser focused on passion. Um, it was not a hard sell at all. Um, we just had to really search a little harder to find people who were passionate about their craft and committed to, to the narratives that we wanted to tell. Um, so there weren't, weren't any major challenges with casting, but when we're looking for people, we just want people who know how to resonate with the audience, who know how to command the stage, who have a presence that already is existent so that we're not having to create that. And then from there, we really focus on molding um, the presentation, the delivery, and it's just about connection for us. If we can, if, if I can be someone who has written the words and someone can 
present them back to me, um, as it was stated, become the character, and I feel moved, whether that be happy or angry or um, excited, whatever those feelings may be, if I can feel those things, then we know that we have something special. And so that's what we look for during the casting process. And if uh, for our listeners, if you've just joined us here on Bring It On, we're having a very engaging and enlightening conversation with uh, the playwrights of the 2023 Onyx Fest uh, that will be held up in Indianapolis. And uh, they truly are the, the treasure trove uh, of the 2023 Onyx Fest and that they bring their passion, their vision, and uh, so much uh, of, of just a message to all those who will be in the audience. And this is in conjunction with Indy Fringe. Productions will be staged November 3rd through the 5th at the Indy Fringe Basile Theater and on November 10th through the 12th at the Christmas Addicts High School Auditorium. And to get more ticket information for the uh, Onyx Fest, O-N-Y-X Fest.com to purchase your tickets. And with the remaining time that we have, I'd like to go around and just, just ask, um, hey, what's next? <laughs> you all are accomplished playwrights. Um, and one day I look forward to buying, actually going to a, the big screen to buy a ticket to see your production on the big screen or on the silver screen. It's a small screen, but, but what's next? And uh, let's go back around to Josiah. What, what's next for you? So for me, um... Coming up, I have um, workshops I'm doing. So um, tomorrow I'll be with the Asante Art Institute in the morning with a few of my actors and we're going to do um, a deep dive into concept creation. So we're going to help the, um, the Zora's Daughters program create their own sort of mini works, if they will. Um, will look at different inspirations and pull from the works that they've been doing and they will create their own individual monologues tomorrow. Um, coming up in November, um, actually uh, November 13th, so right after we close, um, I will be doing a, um, a deep dive into black acting methods. Um, Dr. Cheryl Luckett has a beautiful collection of Black acting methods, and I will be doing an abridged studio class at the Fonseca Theater Company here in Indianapolis. Um, I'll also be hosting a summer workshop for teenagers who are interested in uh, musical theater and art expression, and that is with uh, conjunction as well with um, Claude McNeil Productions. Um, and I will also be here at Providence Crystal Ray High School doing all of the wonderful musicals and productions that we have going on throughout the season. Um, and finally, to wrap up the year of 2024, um, I will be um, putting on 12 Moods. So hopefully 12 Moods for Black Anguish will um, come to a theater uh, near you next year. And Levi. What's next? Um, well, what's next for me is in, in a short period of time, I'll be flying out to Boston to talk to some people about producing a play I wrote called Imagination. Imagination was a poem that Phyllis Wheatley wrote. And this is a fictitious meeting between Phyllis Wheatley and Alexander Pushkin, two excellent writers of color, poets of color. As a matter of fact, Russia's greatest writer, Alexander Pushkin, whose great whose great grandfather was Hannibal. So they actually come together and, and I'm trying to get that produced in April of 2025 because April is National Poetry Month. And uh, Dolores. Well, uh, my goodness, so many things. Um... I have a, a book that's called Anybody Seen Junebug? And I named that because everybody knows somebody named Junebug, especially in the African-American community. It's actually a spinoff from my novel, Babe. Uh, Junebug is introduced in the novel, not in the play, but in the novel. 
and uh, everybody's running around looking for Junebug, and I won't give any more of that away, but uh, it was also an editor's choice and an award winner uh, when I wrote that. I'm also uh, starting a senior program on November the 14th. It will be at the uh, Martindale Brightwood Library, and I'm inviting area uh, senior citizens to come in and tell me their story. We're going to go through this for like three months. Uh, I'm going to teach uh, different styles of writing. I do creative writing lessons. I've done that in the local schools here. Uh, we're going to uh, have them throw out ideas. I'm going to try to uh, get them on computers. And then the culmination of the event will be I will uh, actually spiral bound uh, their books, put them in a spiral version and invite the public, including the dignitaries and politicians to come in because I know they will be proud of themselves. They have to be at least 65 years old to participate in my program. I'm looking forward to that. And then also, like I said earlier, I work with children. I have proposed a program to put children behind the camera. Uh, to I had a gentleman that was going to uh, let the children use his cameras with him there present, of course, and uh, show them how to operate it. Because I tell people all the time, everybody is not going to be a star. Everybody, all the boys are not going to the NBA. They're not all going to the NFL. And we need to teach our children how to be successful, how to invest in themselves, and how to give them something they can use, you know, throughout their lives. So in the spring of next year, I will start my junior program of filmmakers using children behind the camera. And I deal with children from eight to 18. And so uh, between that, all my duties at church, and like I mentioned earlier, if I get a moment, I would like to uh, flesh out Job, uh, the complaint in the book of Job, and I cannot wait to bring that to a stage somewhere. Audrey. Yeah. Yes, I am uh, very excited about the future. We are going to bring the heart of a man to Atlanta. Um, that is where I'm based. And so in Atlanta, we will bring that production and then we have another production that I am currently writing. So we're looking forward to doing two productions in 2024. And then I have uh, several literary projects that are being released. And then um, I'm also the founder of 13th and Jones Publishing House. So we look forward to continuing to publish a lot of books um, as we see things continue to transition with all of the industries um, books seem to continue to be a place where we know that we can house our stories when our other industries are going through transition. So looking forward to the future. Well, wonderful, everybody. And I have an observation. I'm going to turn it back over to Vernon for a final uh, question here. Um, all of these plays, to me, they, they seem to have a very strong spiritual um, sort of impetus to it. It's uh, self-affirming and it's empowering. Uh, it's revelatory. It's painful, and it's healing. Uh, and for all those reasons, uh, I I just want to encourage everyone under the sound of our voice, our collective voice tonight, to make plans to get up to Indianapolis to see this and to experience this 2023 on Express. Vernon. Um, there's someone out there listening right now. They have the writing bug, if you will. Mm -hmm. They're dying to know what is the process for selection as a play playwright. And, and they have a story that's been just turning over within their spirit and they want to get it out. So what's the process? Well, here's the situation. Uh, if you have a story that you want to tell, get it together, believe in it, polish it up, and have it ready by January, that's when we'll start taking um, submission of scripts uh, for the 2024 Onyx Fest. So um, first of all, just make sure that you have it just the way you want it. Make sure that, that you've um, gotten it to the point where you believe in it and it believes in you and reflects you. And then uh, keep an eye out keep going back to onyxfest.com. We go through this process every year and there'll be five or six 
new writers next year. And, and let me ask you this. Um, all the select, selected playwrights, do they have journalistic liberty to write their play without, say, fear, as someone mentioned earlier, coming in and editing, changing, maybe they don't like the voice or the tone or some yeah. aspect of it, but do they have the liberty to be them? Yeah, I think all of them would agree that we haven't uh, infringed on their creative uh, capacity in the slightest. I mentioned something to everyone at the outset that we are trying to form a relationship with PBS. And in order to do that, uh, those plays have to be broadcast appropriate. Now, I mentioned that as an aside. Let's say you don't care about that. That's not a priority. And you want to have you know, whatever subject matter, whatever uh, language you think is necessary to tell your subject, no. We don't uh, try to uh, guide people away from the natural inclination of their creativity. And on, on the flip side, if they want an objective opinion, then they have the liberty to ask uh, from yeah. those who, and, you know, because in years past, we've had people like Charlotte Kahneman, who's been mm -hmm. there to offer such advice and others too. So, so that's yeah. what's valuable. You know, um, we, we we will go through the process of pre-reading plays before we pass them on to the jurors who make the final decision. Uh, and we have seen some that are wildly inappropriate and not plays at all. Um, and we do make decisions at that point um, that are based simply on quality. Uh, but once you've been invited to participate, uh, if you want to seek input, if you want to seek help, uh, because playwrights uh, many times want their work to be work, what you call workshopped, uh, where individuals can look at it and offer some input. And it's always up to the playwright in the final analysis to either accept or reject it. So, um, yeah, you're right. We, we do provide people who can give great advice as well. We have 90 seconds. I'm going to go around one more time. I'm going to take that risk. If you have uh, a sentence to sum up uh, why someone should come out, Josiah, what would that be? Just come out and see the show. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Just come. Just come. <laughs> All right. Le Levi. Uh, for so long, Black voices have been silenced or ignored or as a television show said, lost, stolen, astray. So Onyx Fest gives those voices life and meaning. And so mm -hmm. going back to what Josiah said, please come out and see the show so you can hear the voices. All yes. right. Dolores. You're going to love Babe. She was my mom. You're going to love her as much as I did, maybe even more. Come see it. And Audrey. I would say this day, this this opening weekend and the second weekend, it won't ever happen again. And so when we realize how important moments are, we have to seize them. So come to the show because this will not happen again. History is being made. And on that note, um, Bernard, go ahead. Once again, the 2023 Onyx Fest experience is presented by the Africana Repertory Theater of IUPUI, better known as ARTI, in conjunction with Indie Friends Productions. It's going to be staged November 3rd through the 5th at the Indie Friends Basile Theater and November 10th through the 12th at the Christmas Addicts High School Auditorium. So you want to visit onyxfest.com to purchase your tickets. And for the first time this year, we're offering group sales discounts as well as passes that you can get at a discount and go see all five shows. Wonderful. Bring It On has an open submission policy. So if you have an idea for this program, let's hear it. Send an email to our volunteer staff. The address is Bring It On at WFHB. Make sure you share everything and anything affecting the app. 
email address once again is bring it on at wfhb.org. Bring it on its executive producer is Clarence Boone. Our assistant producer is yours truly. Now, show consultant and WFHB News Department Director is Cade Young. Program engineer is Chantal Lafontaine. And original theme music was created by Jamil Ephiam with additional background tracks by David Baker. For WFHB, I'm Vernon Williams. And I'm Clarence Boone. Be sure to tune in next Monday at 6 p.m. for another edition of Bring It On right here on your community radio station, WFHB.